All right, everyone. <clears throat> Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and welcome to the Friday Video Masterclass, where today we are entering part four of Premiere Pro Basics, and we're going to focus on working with PSDs, so like 2D media, PSD files in Premiere, both creating them directly from Premiere and importing PSDs from Photoshop, uh, working a little bit with 3D coming from After Effects. So really just the process of how that works. Talk a little bit about how you can take your 3D content, particularly if you're doing things like making logo bugs or any um, graphical elements that you might use in the context of like a motion graphics template, how you can turn that 3D into a reusable element that you can drag directly from your CC libraries, making that process a heck of a lot easier. And then we'll end uh, today's session talking a little bit about working with 360 VR content in Premiere, which um, I'm curious in the chat, you know, let me know, are you working with 360 VR still? Like a lot of trends in video and media, you know, things tend to ebb and flow. And I still see a lot of stuff like for Oculus, you know, for gaming, but I'm not seeing so much 360 video these days. So I'm just curious if you're into that, let me know. Uh, would love to hear about it. So as always, we're coming to you live on uh, Adobe Live, YouTube, and Twitter. So thank you so much for joining. Got some really weird stuff going on with my hair today. Uh, real quickly, we've got Kellen in here, Z by HP. Nice to see you. What's up, Cody? Ravi Fleming, Pure Passion. Hello, hello. Shalomi Arditi, nice to see you. Michael Abu Jarur, great to see you as well. All right. And uh, let's see here. We've got NXT and Sabson and Walid Banesa. Very nice to see you too. All right, so why don't we go ahead and uh, let's get into it here. I'm gonna jump to my uh, Premiere Pro real quickly. Should also point out that this morning is one of those mornings where you know your machine is just like something's up. Yeah, I, I I'm just, just preempting this stream today. <laughs> Weird things could happen. I don't know. I had to do a bunch of restarts. Stuff just like wasn't functioning for some reason. Um, knocking on some wood. Hopefully it looks fine. Pure passion. Your hair looks amazing. You're very nice. Thank you. It's uh, it's a little unruly today. You know, I had, I don't know if I told you last week, I had uh, four inches cut off. Not that you can tell, but it's a lot shorter than it was, uh, which has made it a lot more manageable, but it's been very hot. I see people talking about the weather here. It's been very, very hot. And a week and a half ago, we had about seven to 10 days of monsoons. So it was very humid, which it never is here. And that humidity is lingering ever so slightly. So, you know, when that happens, what are we talking about? Software. Okay. Software rot, Z by HP. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You know, it's, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Could just be today. Everything is fine yesterday. It's just, you know, it's one of those weird things. Like it gets caught in some weird loop. And even when restarting, it's just not clearing it out. Thank you, Kellen. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, it's just kind of, it's not even sluggish. It's just like doing weird stuff and or not responding. So I guess, yes, yeah, sluggish, but just not responding. Okay. So let's start by just talking about working with Photoshop files. And this is something which, you know, I've been saying for years, some people are still not fully aware of the fact that of course, Premiere Pro works completely natively with layered PSDs. And you also have the ability if you wanted to say, create some kind of you know, I, there's lots of different ways to do now text overlays and things with essential graphics. But if you wanted to build something in Photoshop or do something from a still, maybe take a still here, send it over to Photoshop and do a quick repair for some reason, and then bring it back into Premiere, you can do that directly from Premiere Pro as well. And as I've said over the years, the nice thing here is that Premiere Pro not only, you know, imports PSDs natively, but it'll, it'll respect a lot of the different layer elements, right, from a from a PSD file, which other apps simply won't be able to do. So layer style, layer, layer styles, layer sets, up to 10 levels deep, maybe even more now, um, you just have a little bit more flexibility working with that native PSD file in Premiere. So let's just say let's just start out very basic. And you know, we want to do some kind of a, you know, just very basic text thing, maybe we'll add some text effects that we have in Photoshop that I can't do here in essential graphics. So I just want to build a static PSD. Uh, for this video that I shot in Africa here. So directly from the Premiere Pro file menu under new, you'll see that you have new Photoshop file. All right. 
Now, the benefits of doing it this way are that it's automatically going to take all of the attributes of your sequence. And by that, I mean your, your you know, the, the, <laughs> what? The demand. <laughs> Why can't I think of what word I want to say? Uh, the dimension, the resolution, the size of your video, in this case, 1920 by 1080. It also already knows the time base. So again, when you're dealing with things where you're going to be animating and stuff, kind of important to know these things. And most important of all, the pixel aspect ratio. So really, while you could have created this in Photoshop and imported it separately, the benefit of doing it this way is that Premiere already knows the attributes of the sequence you're working in, and it will create a Photoshop file based on those attributes in that correct frame size, as well as pixel aspect ratio. And that's, you know, 90% of the battle right there. We don't have too much of this issue anymore. You know, back in the day when most things were not square pixels, um, or many were not square, you were dealing with DV with these weird aspect ratios, you know, you'd create something in Photoshop, you're like, oh, amazing, you'd bring it into Premiere, and of course it would be, you know, squeezed or stretched because you had the wrong aspect ratio, and then you'd have to go back and change that, and it was a drag. So you never have to worry about that here, all right? So let's go ahead and click OK. It's going to ask to give it a name. I'm just going to stick it on the desktop, and we'll call this uh, Africa. Click Save. All right. And now we're in Photoshop, OK? And again, you know, nothing nothing fancy here. I'm not going to wow you with my Photoshop skills. That's what Voodoo Val and uh, many of our other esteemed streamer colleagues are here for. But this is just to show you the workflow. So uh, again, now, if I wanted to just say do something very, very basic, very simple, all right? I'm not, I'm not going to go and try and do anything particularly fancy here. Um, you know, I always struggle with text and color. <laughs> uh, we're going on top of orange, so maybe we'll do like a, a blue. I don't know, this is probably going to be terrible. Or just white. I don't know. Why do I stress over this so much? And let's not do Adobe Clean. Let's do uh, maybe not Cool Vetica. Let's do Futura. And let's make that a lot bigger. OK. And while I'm at it here, I'm going to do my little cardinal sin. I'll add a little drop shadow. <laughs> All right. And let me just affect the spread a little bit. All right, look at that. That's a beautiful, te <laughs> beautiful text right there. OK, done in Photoshop. Amazing, right? So let's go ahead and save. And we can leave this open or we can close it. Doesn't really matter. Uh, I'll come back to it in any case. Let's go back to Premiere. All right, now we're in Premiere and you're like, oh, well, I don't see anything. Right. But what you might see is that down in the project panel now, we have that PSD file. So if I go ahead and drag this in, wherever we want it, there it is, OK? Now, we're bringing this in as a, uh, with all of your layers merged together. Now, that doesn't really matter. You can still, of course, animate this just as if it's a piece of video or a graphics block. If we were to go into effects controls, you know, all of the position, keyframing, all of that stuff. So, you know, if we wanted to fly this on screen, Right, where this is kind of our end position. I was just watching. Voodoo Val was just doing animation, right? So, you know, you could very quickly do something like this, you know, fly Africa on there, right? And while we're at it with those keyframes, we can add a little temporal interpolation and ease in. All right, and let's also make that auto Bezier. And uh, maybe we also want to do, you know, slight opacity. So, opacity here, 100% back it up, and we'll make it 0. Oh, whoops, wrong clips. What, are, what am I doing here? All right, make sure you're, the right one is selected. OK, let's wind back, drop the opacity on that. OK, you get the idea. All right, now, once you've got that PSD in Premiere, as mentioned, the fact that you created it from Premiere, and by the way, you can see your little opacity ramp automatically gets drawn on your clip here. Now, any changes that we make to this will be updated automatically. So if I wanted to re-edit 
I can simply say edit in Photoshop. All right, and it brings us right back here. And you know, let's say for instance, you know, first I just wanted to, you know, whatever it is. I'm not going to, you know, wow you with my abilities here. It's more about that you can do all of this, right? So let's say we want it to be, you know, pink instead of blue. All right, and we change the font to Cool Vetica. I'm going to go ahead and close Africa here, back to Premiere, and you can see now because we have it in the timeline. The changes that we make over there are automatically reflected. But of course, the animation that we already created stays. So we don't lose any of the work that we did. Now, the really cool thing about working with native PSDs here is that um, now this was something which momentarily, I realize as I'm saying this, had broken the last time I tried to show it. I don't know if it's working right now. We don't have enough time to do it also. But I was going to say, having just watched Val's uh, stream a little while ago, you can also bring in animated PSDs, and those animations should be preserved if you bring them in in this method, where in other words, it's you're not going to be able to change those animations, um, but you'll be able to view them, right? Similarly, if you had like 3D elements in your Photoshop file. So it's just a lot of flexibility when working with PSD in Premiere. Admittedly, you don't need to do it as much now because we have essential graphics. And if you've been watching any of these streams, it's so much easier now to create text overlays and, and you know motion graphical elements. Really, again, I would go to Photoshop if there were some specific text effects or something I wanted to do to an image that's in my video. Or just maybe I'm just more comfortable creating you know, lower thirds and things in Photoshop. Whatever it is for you, you can do that really easily. All right. So that's creating directly uh, from Premiere Pro. Now, what if you wanted to import a Photoshop file? So here's here's where things get really, really cool and uh, and really interesting. So I'm going to bring up a, a, a file here. This is not the one that I want. Or is it? It is. OK. Uh, let me see if I drag. I, if I drag, it should give me the same dialogue here. I'm just I'm wanting to make sure that I get the same import option. I do. OK. So I don't know if you saw that. I just dragged a PSD from the media browser into the project panel. This is the equivalent of me going File, Import, and locating it. I had just located it in the media browser because it's 100 layers deep in some folder somewhere. OK. So when you bring in an already created layered PSD file, this is what you're going to see. All right. So you have the option here to merge all layers. So this is what I was just talking about. That file, of course, it was just one layer, just at Africa, right, with our little um, drop shadow. But if we had created something from Premiere, did it in Photoshop, saved, go back to Premiere, it's essentially all merged together. We can't see all of the layers in Premiere. We just see the end result. When you're importing a PSD instead of creating one, now you get to choose how you want to treat those layers. So the default behavior is just to merge it all down into one basically like a video clip, OK? So that's merge all. Then you have merged layers. This is the same thing. The difference is when you go into this option, now you can enable or disable which layers you want visible, and then it'll import all of those, again, as just one clip, OK? So merge all is the same, it just means all the layers you don't get to choose. Merged is all the layers again, but you choose which ones you want to appear in that sort of think of it as like a flattened PSD, although it, it, it isn't, but for display purposes it is. Then you can choose to bring in each layer as an individual layer. And again, this is the same concept here where you can choose, you know, which of these you want to enable or disable. And then the really cool option here, which again, Val was just kind of showcasing this natively in the Photoshop side. You can also bring in all those layers as a sequence. So let's go ahead and try that. Let's go. Let's start with that. So I'm going to click OK on this. All right. Creates a folder for us. Go into that folder. Should have a sequence here. And here it is. All right. And if we now take a look in the timeline, Move this uh, bin out of the way. Why is this not docked? It's weird. Dock this back over here. All of our layers now are separated onto their own tracks. Okay. 
So, and this is whatever's contained in each of those layers. Now, this is another good reason why, you know, really good idea to name everything properly so that you know what each of those does. But, you know, if I just here, um, let me just maximize this for a second so we can enable or disable these. So, you know, you've got your, your background border here, all right? Then all the various images of Jesse, okay? Well, that's cool, I didn't even notice that one before. All right, that looks like, again, just some kind of an adjustment layer right there. Another color adjustment layer right there. Again, these elements are respected from the PSD. And, you know, you get the idea. So the point is, just as we were talking about before, let's say, you know, we wanted to, to reveal uh, each of these layers in this, in this timeline, in this comp. Well, it's as simple as, as you know, setting, uh, in this case, like an opacity keyframe on this particular layer. At that point, winding back, adjusting opacity. So Jesse flies on from the bottom down there, all right? And maybe while he flies on, you know, this is the next one here. Let's go to this one. I'll we'll do the same thing. So opacity 100% there, but maybe at this point where that one's at 50, this will be negative. All right, so they're all kind of cascading in. And then we've got this one down here. Same thing. All right, so opacity at 100 right there. Wind it back while that one's at 50. All right. And where's the... Uh... There it is. There's the name. Okay, and we'll save this one for last. So opacity there. Wind it back, and maybe I'll have that sort of appear over time. They gradually start coming in. All right, play this back. Real simple. Again, not, not fancy, but it's manipulating all of those Photoshop layers just as you saw Val do before if you were watching the DCC, okay? So this is just, you know, another level, first of all, of flexibility if you're trying to do animation. Here's the other thing. Just as you're watching me go back and forth with this, all in full quality, I might add. Um, if you're wanting to do animation, and you just saw Val do it, here's the thing you need to know. Your performance, in terms of playback, is going to just be way smoother on the Premiere side, because that's what Premiere is meant to do. Now, you do have you know, fractional playback options now in Photoshop, which make the playback better. But if you're doing something fairly complex, like what she was doing before was pretty complex. I find it very challenging to do it in the Photoshop timeline. You already, it's the same keyframing concept. It's nothing new, nothing different. If you feel more comfortable, do it there. The point is you don't have to, you could also do it here. And then of course you have all of the other tools readily accessible to you in terms of how you treat this as if it were video. So it's just a little bit more flexibility, but again, it's, it's entirely a, a personal choice as to um, you know what you do with this, and you know I got to say I really I do I like I love this poster I forgot how good this looked. Terry and I have shown this for years. Super cool. Okay. <laughs> I wish that I had Jesse's girl. Very nice reverb mic. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Nice tip. Okay. Arakia Rahman, never late, my friend. Always nice to see you. Okay. Very cool. All right. Nice. Okay, I don't see any more questions there. All right. All right. So that's PSDs. By the way, almost forgot. Um, I didn't really start with our schedule today, as I've been doing. Let me let me just pull that up. So we've already we're already through three parts of it. Okay. So uh, creating a PSD in Premiere, we did that. Edit in Photoshop, Edit Original, did that. We just imported a layered PSD and animated those layers, okay? So now, why was I over the top? I need a V8 or something. I don't know what's going on with me today. Now we're gonna do a little 3D from After Effects. <laughs> Live. Someone asked how many streams um, I've done, and I couldn't give them an exact number. I said, well, I know between 19, 2019 and 2020, it was an upwards of 300 something. It was around 330 or 350 streams in the, between those two years. Last year was insanity. Okay, 
Last year was a lot of streaming. Okay. As as one would have expected when we were all locked down. Okay. So let's uh, let's move on over to After Effects. I think we're gonna go back to this same same shot for a minute here. Now, when it comes to 3D and After Effects, uh, and we've shown a little bit of this on the stream here. You know, this was we redid the whole 3D engine last year at Max. Um, this is actually a piece of that asset. The 3D tools have all been. Uh, redesigned and just made to work better. 3D performance in general is just stunningly awesome. And, you know, again, if you take your orbit tools, you know, you can just, you can move around the 3D scenes and After Effects now. I mean, it, it feels, it feels like substance. You know, if you've ever used substance, it's just so real time and so smooth. Same thing here. Also, you'll see it goes into preview so much faster. You know, if you want to do dolly in, dolly out, you know, this this kind of thing. Again, it's just it's just smooth. It just works the way you expect it to work. So I'm just creating a little very quick animation here, um, which ultimately maybe I want to use in an edit or something like that. All right. And it, it goes off the rails right there. So I'm actually going to end the comp right there. OK, so you have a couple of different options in terms of how you work with this content. You know, if we wanted to bring this into um, a Premiere Pro edit. All right. And I'm by the way, I'm putting on the uh, the transparency grid so that you can see I took the background off here. So essentially, we've got something that has an alpha channel. So if I wanted to overlay this 3D content over top of my video, I could do that really easily. All right. So let's let's show kind of the I don't say the old school method, but sort of the traditional method of doing this, which is dynamic link. Now, I talked about this a lot on the stream. I know many people have different experiences with the dynamic link. Here's the idea. You can take an After Effects comp that is live, that is not rendered, drag it into the Premiere, to, uh, Premiere Pro timeline. Premiere Pro now also has the AE playback engine in there. So you have to scrub through it if you haven't cached all your frames. All of our frames are already cached. So technically, if I were to drag this in, it should play in the Premiere Pro timeline in real time. If not, just scrub through it, let it cache those frames. It'll catch up pretty quickly these days. You can do that for anything that you create in After Effects. So this doesn't only apply to 3D workflows. It applies to any content um, that you're working with in After Effects can, can uh, be leveraged in Premiere in real time via dynamic link. And we're going to do it via a simple drag and drop. So I just want to make sure that my project panel is exposed here. This is just going to make life a little bit easier for me. Let me just make the interface a little bigger. All right, I'm just going to stack another, let's make another track right there. We, want, we don't want any audio, just a video track. Okay. Make that a little bigger, all right. Back over to After Effects. And this comp is called Mountain Zoom. So I'm going to take the Mountain Zoom composition right here. All right. I'm going to click and drag and drag it over into Premiere Pro. All right. And when I do that, as promised, now I am scrubbing through this as if it's a piece of live video in Premiere, right? And if I take this, and I now drag this into my timeline. Okay. I now get to have real oh, and as promised, I told you, you're not always going to get that performance. Oh, look at those last couple of frames. It's kind of <laughs> it choked on a little. That's all right. It also brought in the whole piece, which I didn't want. All right. But now we've got real real time 3D happening inside of flat 2D material, and this is all live, okay? So just like with the PSD file, all right? If I make a change to something here, okay? So let's just go to, I always use the same ones because they're just obvious and it's easy to see. I'm gonna add some blue wash on those mountains, all right? 
I don't need to really adjust their X, Y, but if I did, again, these are the new on-screen, uh, we call them gizmos. I don't know that I love that name, but it is what it is. All right, and while I'm in After Effects, I'm quickly going to, you know, space bar preview it here, okay? Obvious change made. Back over to Premiere. <laughs> Position and color of our mountains change just like that. Wind it back, hit play, and we're rocking, okay? And full. That does not mean full of love and joy, although it could. It means full frame, full quality, all the pixels, okay? So your mileage may vary in terms of performance. We're ha we got lucky here. I told you at the beginning stuff was wonky. Now it's great. You know, you just never know with computers. But um, performance-wise, dynamic link, if you do it right, it works. This is the concept, okay? So it's just the idea that anything that you build in a 3D space from After Effects can exist and live inside of flat 2D material in Premiere Pro non-destructively via dynamic link. But there's an easier way. I say easier in the sense that it's easier if you want editable 3D content, but you never really want to go into After Effects. You just want to have parameters that you can tweak over here on the Premiere side. And this involves taking that comp and turning it into a motion graphics template, all right? So let, let's do it. I, I'm curious to see what, um, you know, what we might want to do here. Now, this particular comp, there's not a lot of things that you would ultimately be able to edit necessarily um, in Premiere. I could, of course, change certain things like, uh, you know, these back mountain, um, parameters here. Let's see if I sh solo supported properties. So, you know, obviously we could we could set up things like moving the uh, relative position of the camera or any of the clouds or any of these things. These could all become editable parameters. And the way that you do that, can we even see which cloud that is? It's not even on screen right now. Let's see. I'll zoom back down over here. Can't even see the moon from that perspective. Okay, so here's our back mountains. So, oh, and there's some color balance on there. So maybe we want, um, you know, the, the hue and lightness and saturation. Okay, and I'm going to rename this back mountain hue. Okay, what I've just done is I am telling the essential graphics panel in After Effects I want these parameters to be editable to my editor via this um, motion graphics template that we're building. All right. All these things with regard to color balance, all of that could be modified. And then we have, you know, like X, Y, Z. So let, let's just take those three parameters here. And I'm just going to, again, change the name like this. Okay. By the way, I used this solo supported properties button to let me know which properties are supported for editability in the motion graphics template. Okay. I'm going to save this as for a second here. I'm going to call this live. All right. Now I could add other elements to this. Okay. I'm just making a point here. We're just going to keep this as it is for now. The idea is that let's say that I want to be able to use this mountain intro again, all right, on other things. Now, this is, again, another area where maybe I do want to be able to adjust elements of the camera, right? We have all of these different parameters of the camera here. Um, you know, this would allow me to do all of that. And those are, in fact, uh, supported parameters. So here I could even add, add a comment. These are camera parameters. And I could drag in the camera X, camera Y, camera Z, camera zoom, and uh, focus distance. Why not? Okay. Put all those in there. All right. 
And now I'm going to export this as a motion graphics template, okay? It's going to ask me to save the project. I'm going to stick it in my JSON's library, which I really need to make a new one. This one's getting very, very full. And then I'm going to put in some keywords. So mountain 3D intro uh, ground plane and sun. This will just make it in case I can't find it. I can search on keywords like mountain and it would pull up that motion graphics template in Premiere for me. Let's go ahead and click OK on this. It's going to verify, do its thing. And now we just made a draggable motion graphics template version of this same comp. OK? So stick with me now, all right? Let me go ahead. I want to um, stick it into something else. Let me reveal this video in the project. I'll make a new sequence from this, OK? Now notice, here we are in Premiere. It happened so quickly, you probably didn't even, even see. Here's the motion graphics template we just created in my CC library. Now, I just want to point out, if you go to the Info button here, this is going to tell you a little bit more about it, OK? So the title, the duration, the file size, the keywords. I can't emphasize how important that is because the organization of the folder libraries is it's a little wonky in, in the Essential Graphics panel in Premiere. So this just makes it easier to find stuff if you just have those. By the way, if you also favorite, if this is a reusable element that you're going to constantly come back to, highly recommend favoriting because then you can just search on favorites and there they are. Really makes life a lot easier. But now I can take this and I can drag this down into the timeline. Okay, Loads up pretty quickly. Click on it. And look at that. Now in Essential Graphics, I can see all of the parameters that we allowed to be editable are available to me as the editor here in Premiere. Now, as I mentioned, right, this might not play back immediately in real time because it has to cache those frames. Well, we have that other dynamic link running. This is totally new. This is a new instance of this. So as I scrub through, it's going to cache those frames. So let's go ahead and just play it now. Beautifully cached. I mean, it's funny having that. Uh, three. By the way, that's the back of Paul's head right there, if anybody's interested. All right. But this is all happening now in real time. OK. So what if we wanted to adjust you know, the back mountain uh, hue? Notice we can adjust the hues. Let's make them purple. Does everybody see that changing? Yes. All right purple in real time, the saturation, all right? Maybe the rotation of those, okay? Or parts of the camera or zoom, right? We can adjust the zoom on the camera here. Not the greatest change I made there. Focus distance, I don't know what that's gonna do necessarily, but you're getting the idea. So I've now made editable parameters for this motion graphics template. Now again, we're going to have to recache those frames. So I'm going to have to drag through again to make sure that it caches those that plays in real time. But I'm able to manipulate whatever parameters I set forth in the essential graphics side on After Effects. I can manipulate those here now in Premiere. So again, it's just another way to integrate 3D. Now you can imagine, right? Let's say you had, I mentioned like a logo bug or some kind of branding element that you wanted to, um, that you wanted to use. This makes it super easy to do that. Now I have another one that I already did here and you may have seen it before. This is my old um, Jace's Places logo. So this was created a couple of years ago. Let me just mute all these others. Now this one, this was also created several years ago. So I don't I don't know. It was taking a minute to display. Yeah, this is this is an old Mogert. So there we go. Again, talking about having to cache those frames. 
So you can see I'm dragging through it and I'm caching the frames here. All right, so this was a 3D, uh, a 3D logo intro that I had a designer make for me. Very intense 3D. By the way, again, created with the um, Cinema, 4, Cinema 4D extrusion engine, but before we revamped all the 3D tools. So this was kind of done old school, all right? Now, again, I'm scrubbing through this so that you're going to get real-time playback. But you can see that we're overlaying true 3D over top of this video. And as far as editability, the only things that I allowed to be editable were the colors. So JPS, so those specific letters that have those hues, here are the colors that you can edit, right? So if I want, now this actually works for this landscape here, for this particular scene. But let's say I wanted, instead of that, uh, uh, that blue, let's say we wanted this to be, you know, a bit more on the red side. All right, something like that. I don't know how that's going to look in terms of color harmony, but we'll see. All right, give it a second. It updates on screen, okay? Now, again, because I've now made this change, I would have to scrub through this to cache those frames so that I can get real-time playback again. But the whole point is that if I'm making my show, Jace's Places, and I know that I'm going to keep using this 3D logo, I don't need to open up After Effects and drag it in every time. I can save it as a motion graphics template and then use that as my reusable variation. And this workflow in and of itself is so cool because it just gives you an enormous amount of flexibility. And again, I don't need to have access to everything. I'm not changing all parts of this. I want to be able to change the color based on the environment we're in. Or, you know, maybe, maybe I'd have specifically, you know, uh, I'd give access to the color range of this this mount this white mountain cap here because I'd like to be able to change it from light to dark based on time of day or if I wanted to give it you know like a, a, a you know some kind of a, a golden hour hue whatever you know maybe I wanted opacity options for some of those layers those things can all be editable parameters through your motion graphics template it's just entirely up to you but as you saw. It's just a matter of dragging parameters in. Which parameters, you ask? Well, you just click on Solo Supported Properties, and then it's going to show you all of the properties that are available to you to add to the Motion Graphics template. All right, and you'll see, because we're working with 3D layers, um, you know, the ability to enable cast shadows, light trans, all of these parameters can be part of that Motion Graphics template, all right? Super cool. Brazil, great old movie. I agree. Diego, what's up, man? Umicorn, how are you? All right. Just checking here. All right. Very good. Okay. No more cues. All right. Either you're really into it or you've fallen asleep. <laughs> okay. So that's a little bit on working with 3D elements from After Effects in Premiere Pro via dynamic link, drag and dropping the comp, or simply by building up your own motion graphics template via the Essential Graphics panel, exporting as a motion graphics template, and then dragging right into Premiere and having access to only those parameters that you want to edit. So flexible, all right? Okay, so for our last uh, 15 minutes or so, we're going to uh, go back in time. So by the way, I didn't see anybody in the chats here say that they're working in VR. So if you are, just give me a thumbs up or say something. <laughs> because if you're not, I'll never show it again. No, I'm just curious. OK? OK. So VR, here's the thing about VR. If you're shooting with VR content, Hold on, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. If you're shooting 360 VR content, the amazing thing is working in Premiere editing is exactly the same. Nothing really changes. There are two fundamental things that you need to be aware of. The first is Premiere Pro currently, at present, only works with VR content that has been stitched 
or exported as what's known as equirectangular format media. There's lots of different flavors of VR. There's cube, there's um, uh, spherical, there's, uh, I can't even remember all the different options now because I just don't work with it that much anymore. There's a lot of different formats of VR. Equirectangular is the one that Premiere Pro wants to work with. So if you're shooting with some camera and, you know, again, they'll stitch it to give you this kind of a look. So by the way, this is some uh, 6K footage shot in Venice. We're not inside of the viewer yet. We're just seeing what the full 360 looks like end to end, okay? Enable to, to be able to see this in a 360 um, immersive environment, spatial environment, you have to enable the 3D viewer, the VR viewer. Did I just say 3D? The VR viewer. And of course, that's a button that's inside of the button editor that is not made um, available by default. So you have to turn that on. So first and foremost, let's do that. So in the program monitor, we're going to go to our plus button here to open the button editor. And then the one that we're looking for is this. It kind of looks like a head wearing a headset. <laughs> sort of, oh, I just got like an allergy attack. Let's go ahead and take VR video display. I'll drag it next to my effects mute, click okay. And now when I click this, now we're in VR and it's like we're in a VR viewer. And if I click and simply drag the video, now you can see we're seeing a true, you know, 360 degree representation of this, okay? Now, I always get asked the question when I show this stuff, so why is it square? Because, you know, my VR viewer is widescreen. It's, you know, it's two to one or it's 16 by nine or whatever. Okay. By default, most of your view, many viewers that previously you used to deliver square because really widescreen, I mean, I, I get whatever. I don't know. VR makes me puke. I don't use a lot of VR. I don't use any VR because it makes me vomit. Traditionally, though, most of your viewers were really showcasing a square aspect ratio in the viewer. Some were doing 16.9, some were doing 2 to 1. The point is, if you click on the little wrench menu here, you'll see that you have VR video settings, okay? And if we go into the settings, you can change the uh, monitor view angle, horizontal and vertical. So if we wanted like a two to one instead of a square, now we've got two to one, all right? So, and this is just for preview. This doesn't affect where it's going or how it's displayed. That will be determined by whatever the goggles you're using support, right? Some have a square view, some have just other aspect ratios. <laughs> This is purely how you want to view it inside of Premiere. And you can set it to whatever your device uses so that you're seeing exactly the same thing, right? Makes sense. So that's all contained in the VR video settings, all right? Now, additionally, you also have this uh, show controls option. This just gives you the starting coordinates. And we're going to come back to this in a moment because one of the most common questions people always ask me is, well, what if I want to change the starting orientation. This is where this video starts. So when you put the VR headset on and you're looking straight ahead, this is the view. Now it makes sense. It's the front of the, the gondola. It's not a very exciting view. Maybe I want to be able to see those clowns in the back or whatever was going on in there. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. But as mentioned, you can also just turn off those controls because they, they kind of get in the way. All right. And again, you still have the freedom here to sort of move about. All right. So Again, enabling the uh, VR video display, changing the aspect under settings. The default is square, 180 by 180. You can customize to whatever you want. Let's just leave it wide for now, okay? And we're gonna come back to stereoscopic. I have a little piece of stereoscopic footage I'll show you in just a couple minutes. All right, so that's essentially it. And now, you know, once you're in Premiere and you're in this viewer, you can see I'm scrubbing, we're playing content, okay? All right, and why isn't it following the boat? Well, because I haven't keyframed anything. Now, the other nice thing is if you are actually editing with a headset and you're just kind of stitching things together, putting clips together, um, you see that you do have 
the ability here to enable the Adobe Immersive Environment. So you're going to turn this on if you're working with a headset while editing. This also, if you've seen, this also enables you to do some very basic editing with the timeline in your goggles, where you can actually see the timeline and you can scrub and play through. It's pretty cool. It's, it's, it's really pretty cool. You also have the ability to monitor ambisonic audio, so spatial audio in your VR headset if you have the correct hardware connected to your system. So if you're going to be working in a headset while editing, enable both of those things. It's going to make the experience that much nicer for you, okay? So let's, um, I just want to skip ahead a little bit here. It's running out of time. Let's talk about changing the uh, the starting orientation because like I said this is this is always this is always the first thing that people ask me all right and just to keep it honest I'm going to show controls so when it's at zero zero this is the starting orientation of this clip but like I said maybe we don't like that it's just kind of boring all right let's go up to effects I'm gonna type VR and you'll see that under effects we have two folders for immersive video. The one that you want to use to change the starting orientation is this one here called VR Rotate Sphere. So I'm simply going to drag this onto my clip and go into Effects Controls. All right, and when I do that, now you're going to see that we have really three simple parameters here. Tilt, X, Pan, Y, Roll, Z. So if I want this video to start, and here I'm going to disable this for a second, Let's turn off the controls. I want it to start with the clowns in the frame. I'm going to adjust the Y axis like this, okay? 70 to 73 degrees. Now, if I go back to my show controls, notice that they show zero and zero. So we have now just changed the starting orientation. So if I were to export this video right now, this is the first thing people see, not this. Okay? And you can customize it further. You know, you're like, oh, it wasn't all the way in the frame. Or maybe we want to go from the back of the boat or have it angled up or whatever. You can make that adjustment via VR Rotate Sphere. Okay? So that's how you adjust the starting orientation of your video. All right? Really easy most common question I think I get asked with regard to VR, all right? Second most common question is, how do I integrate uh, like a motion graphics template or just text inside of VR, okay? Well, similar concept. I've got a little uh, graphic that I created here, okay? Stick it right there, all right? You can see it's Venice in the summertime, okay? Nothing fancy. Basic text, border, that's it. I want to have that oriented in 360 VR. So we'll turn on the viewer, and okay, now we're in VR, but you know, again, this is this is weird because it's it's now bent because this motion graphics template was created in a non-360 environment. So it doesn't know what to do. So it's bending it because it senses it's spherical, but that's not that's not what we want, right? We want that to, to be flat because maybe I want to, you know, orient this along the wall or something like that, okay? So we're gonna go back up to effects. And for this, we're now going to choose VR plane to sphere. So this is going to allow you to take two dimensional flat graphical elements. This could also be an image right? It could be another video and essentially convert that into a, a spherical element so that it understands how it's supposed to behave in this 360 sequence, okay? So if I take VR plane to sphere, drag it over top of that, the first thing you're going to see is that it, it shrinks down, okay? Let's go into effects controls, VR plane to sphere, and we're going to do something similar. First of all, I want to adjust the projection, right? So I want to move it along the y-axis. And you can see right here, I'm dragging it over. And now it is perfectly oriented along the wall. It is no longer bent or skewed on the wall 
like it was moments ago, all right? Now you also have the ability to rotate the source itself. So if, you know, in orienting this, again, maybe this shot, I'm assuming this was shot with this person in this gondola and they're perfectly upright so that the perspective isn't a little off. You know, maybe the, the X rotation is a little off here. So you can correct that by rotating the source, okay? Similarly with like the, the roll, you know, maybe it's a little off because they're, they're in a boat, you know, that could happen. You also have the ability here to use blend modes. So uh, we could screen this on here, or sorry, let's see. Overlay, that's what I wanted to do, not screen. Now, keep in mind, you're seeing like, oh, well, it's, it's over top of the windows. Yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't keyframe this. In other words, I didn't lock this in position, right? It's locked in the sense that if I move away, and by the way, this is where it, the uh, plane to sphere is so cool, because notice now it respects the exact orientation as I move out of the scene, right? But I didn't just glue that to the wall, right? The, the, the camera's moving. So it's just gonna stay oriented there, but it's always in the correct perspective. So this is kind of a, it, it's a little difficult to get your head around if you're not used to working in VR. You're like, well, that's not doing what I want. I want it to stay on the wall. Okay, well, the camera's moving. It's moving away. So you could keyframe it and you could keyframe it off screen, right? That's how you would need to do that if you wanted it to always stay in that position. What we've done is we've oriented it into the scene in the correct perspective, okay? But you can do that with any uh, 2D element via plane to sphere, all right? And like I said, it's just, it's really cool when you have something like this because, I mean, even, look, even the blend mode actually looks pretty good. I'd probably dirty this up because obviously it's a little too clean, but it's, it's good. I mean, it, it does what I want it to do, okay? So plane to sphere, rotate sphere, okay? By the way, it's worth pointing out just real quickly, if uh, you bring 360 content into Premiere and it's not displaying properly or you don't seem to have an option, it could be that you didn't uh, set the sequence parameters correctly. Typically with VR content, if I just go ahead and reveal in, uh, in project, you see me, I, you know, every time I make a sequence, I right click and choose new sequence from clip because Premiere knows the attributes of that content. It's going to build a VR sequence because it knows that it's equirectangular VR. If for some reason it didn't, you can go into the sequence settings. Oh, let me just find my Venice VR demo. All right. And at the bottom of your sequence settings, here's where you have VR properties. So you can see that it's equirectangular. Again, it's the only option. Your horizontal and vertical view, and then the layout. Is it monoscopic, which this is, or is it stereoscopic? And for that, there's two methods, over, under, and side by side. So let's get into that, actually. So I'm going to make a new sequence from this clip, okay? And for this one, Let's go into the sequence settings because if I turn off my viewer, oh, it already auto detected. I don't know if you saw that. So it already auto detected this as stereoscopic over under. It knows that this is stereoscopic VR. What does stereoscopic VR look like? Over under looks like this. So remember, here was this is Venice. All right. It's Piazza di San Marco, but that's what it looks like. Non, uh, non, um, 3D, what? Stereoscopic. <laughs> Here's what it looks like stereoscopic over under. And it auto detected this. Now, we don't have time to cover all the stereoscopic options, but again, if we go into settings, if you want to view uh, in stereoscopic with, you know, uh, like the red and blue glasses, you can go into anaglyph mode, okay? And now you'll see this is going to show you sort of what this display will look like if you were viewing this um, with your glasses on, okay? And you also have effects, effects, you have effects in here um, that will allow you to 
adjust um, the uh, the amount, the stereoscopic uh, uh, positioning. So a lot of times, you know, things are a little off. It's too much, and it doesn't actually respect that 3D stereoscopic view. So under projection, you have the ability to make corrections um, to that as well. Your disparity adjustment here. So if you wanted to like tighten up or correct any of those stereoscopic um, artifacts, you can do that here. Okay, and you can see it's got like stretch to fill frame, input auto VR, auto output VR, and then you have pan, tilt, and roll. All right. So a lot of options here. When you're done with this, you simply go File, Export, Media. H.264 is the format you're going to want to go to, and you're going to find a whole series of presets which will allow you to export this for VR, for YouTube, and Facebook. That is all the time we have, my friends. So until next time, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you again. Have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.